grab your gold and hack it. says the rate. Uh, please learn to read AP problems slowly and carefully. I may have said this before. I know that most of you have taken the ACT multiple times and the ACT feels like a race, like you have to hurry. If you hurry on the AP test, you won't get a good score. Like don't hurry on AP test problems, like go carefully. So as I read, I actually pause, I'm like the rate. Uh, rate is always a key word on the AP test. It goes back to this idea that when we're talking about Danica's chart, I think of the first column as an amount, the second column as a rate, and the third column as the rate of the rate. So when I'm reading the problem description and they say rate, I wake up and pay attention to that. The rate at which people enter an amusement park is given by this function. So that's the rate at which people are entering. Then they say the rate at which people leave is given by this function. Uh, I pause right there as well and I remember a little pattern that I've seen on the AP test for many years. They really like giving problems. Let me show a little box here. Give you a chance to copy it down if you want. They really like giving problems that use this idea. You have an amount. Um, I call the amount A of T. That's just me. We have some rate. The rate would be a prime of T. So again, using Danica's chart, you'd be thinking, okay, I've got an amount A amount of something, and then I've got a rate, <coughs> A prime. They often will give one rate as the rate at which something uh, flows in, and then another rate, the rate at which something flows out. Uh, that's what they're doing in the problem we just read. E is the rate at which people are entering the park, L is the rate at which people are leaving. From all that, I can deduce that, okay, we've got this amusement park. There's a rate at which people flow in. There's a rate at which people flow out. Uh, therefore, we must be measuring the number of people in the park. So that's what A would be. And the rate at which the number of people in the park changes, that rate is a combination of the in rate and the out rate, like this. And I've seen that pattern show up in uh, many problems over many years. So this idea is uh, quite, yeah, very, very important. So any questions coming to mind about this idea of an in rate subtracted out rate? it will show up uh, again and again. It's very common. Making sure. Okay, cool. So anyway, uh, that's what I'm thinking as I read the problem. Uh, this box came to mind, this idea of an in rate uh, versus an out rate. So let's go back here to the problem we were reading. Paste that little box in. Okay, so I've got my in rate here. Just one more page and go far enough. There we go. So 
So keep reading. It says both E of T and L of T are measured in people per hour. I would want to note that, people per hour. Uh, that tells me the units here are just people, like that. It says the functions are valid for the time period from time equal 9 to time equal 23, uh, the hours during which the park is open. So they're using military style time here, uh, 9 in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. At time equal 9, there are no people in the park. Thoughts, questions from anyone so far? Just We haven't read any question yet. This is just the information. This is common of an FRQ to give a pretty good sized block of data before they ask any questions. Cool. Um, i got to set something up here. They give me a symbol to represent the in rate. They give me a symbol to represent the out rate. Uh, they, don't give us, they don't give me a symbol to represent the number of people in the park. So I'm going to invent one. I'm going to tell the grader that A of T is equal to number of people in the park. Now I can use the symbol A every time I'm thinking of the number of people in the park. I don't have to keep telling the grader that's what A stands for. Uh, I'm going to use this box right here, my memory of that box, and tell the grader that uh, whenever I use A prime, that's going to represent the in rate, subtract the out rate. So I tell the grader those two facts. Questions? So I have not done anything to answer any questions yet. I'm just going off of my memory of previous AP tests here and remembering that this pattern has been very common and I want to take advantage of that pattern. So, okay. Question says How many people have entered the park by 5 p.m. or time equals 17? How many people have entered the park? So, I'm not worried about how many are in the park. I'm not worried about how many left the park. I'm just paying attention to how many have entered. So, it's a simple idea. If I knew that, just making up some easy numbers here, that 50 people per hour were entering the park, Let's see, from hour 9 to hour 17, uh, that's 8 hours. So 50 people are entering the park, and they entered the park over an 8-hour time period. When I multiply these two together, I would discover that 400 people had entered the park uh, during those 8 hours. So it's a really simple idea. If I know the rate at which people are entering the park, and I know the duration of time for which that rate occurs, I can calculate how many people enter the park during that time period. Okay? You would have a question about this basic idea that you brought with you before you even took calculus. Like, this should feel pretty good to everyone that that's just something we have dealt with in previous years. Questions? Okay, the only difference in this problem is the rate isn't constant for eight hours. The rate is given as a formula, meaning the rate is changing over the eight hour time period. Uh, we don't have any problem dealing with that now because we have an integral as a tool. So what we want to do is we want to do this exact computation, the rate at which people are entering the park, multiplied by the duration of time. But our rate is changing so instead of multiplying one rate by eight hours, we're going to multiply a whole bunch of rates by many, many short durations of time. But it's exactly the same idea. It's not different. It's just we're doing it for very short durations of time. We want to do it repeatedly for a million times.
starting at hour 9, ending at hour 17, this integral will calculate for us, little by little, how many enter the park over those eight hours. Questions? Okay. Uh, this idea is really simple. I just look at it and say, okay, yeah, this makes sense to me because if I'm taking the number of people per hour, that's what this is, and multiplying by a duration of time, that's what this is, I'm going to get the number of people who entered the park during those eight hours. I just do it one little tiny duration of time again and again and again. That's what the integral accomplishes for me. Um, I actually have a little phrase that helps me. If I integrate the rate at which people are entering the park, so that, that little rhyme, integrate the rate. So if I integrate the rate, at which people are entering the park, I will calculate how many entered the park. Uh, I've seen it happen on a whole bunch of different AP problems. I've seen ones where they talk about a tank of water, and they'll give you the rate at which water is flowing into the tank. If I integrate the rate at which water flows into the tank, I can calculate how much water flowed into the tank. Okay, you're starting here with the rate, and by integrating, you're moving to here. So, questions? Awesome. So now all that's left to do is pick up your calculator and type it in. Um, it turned out we didn't use this yet. And we didn't use this. But I can guarantee you on the AP test on an FRQ, if they start describing a situation that is at all similar, where they're giving you an in rate and an out rate, this idea is going to show up. It always does. So if they give you an in rate and an out rate, you can count on using this box. Like it will for sure appear. Even though it didn't appear in part A, it'll be in part B, C, or D. So, question. So I grabbed my calculator, 2002 number two. So I always put my in rate in Y1 and my out rate in Y2. If you were to look at the graphs, you'd see the blue is the in rate, the red is the out rate. And as we talked about, the rate's going up and going down. So integration is going to take care of uh, all of that. Let's go to the main screen. And I want to integrate. So math 9, from hour 9 to hour 17. The in rate, which is in Y1. Ah, uh, helps you type it correctly. Forgot the DX. So 6,004 people entered the park during those eight hours. It's not a very popular amusement park. So. Um, <laughs> think about that many people enter Disneyland every five minutes. I don't know. Um, not quite that bad, but anyway. No worries. Six thousand people over eight hours is not very many. So something like that, do you okay to round it to the nearest whole number for like people? Um, okay. I wanted to give Eric a ticket, but it doesn't matter because it's a different class. But um, listen to Eric's comment. You always round to three decimals unless the 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 instructions tell you differently. So that's why you always want to read slow and careful. And as Eric noticed, this problem specifically says, uh, round your answer to the nearest whole number. So if you don't round, they will take away the point. So it goes both ways. If they don't tell you to round and you do, you lose the point. If they do tell you to round and you don't, you also lose the point. So you just got to be careful to keep an eye on that. So, okay. Anybody else? Cool. That's it. Next one.
Okay, I don't need to read the information again because it's not going to change. So all I have to pay attention to is the new question right here. The price of admission is $15 until, okay, also not Disneyland. Um, <laughs> the price of admission is $15 until 5 p.m. Use your answer from part A, so that was 6,004 people. On an actual AP test, if for some reason you got stuck on part A, uh, you are allowed to simply make up an answer and just tell the grader, I didn't know how to do part A, but let's assume you know, 5,000 people, just whatever number you come up with, it doesn't really matter. And then use that in part, you know, part E, that's, that's legal. Calculate to the nearest dollar how many dollars are collected from admissions to the park on a given day between nine and that. So that's really easy, just multiply. So. And in reality, um, if you box that as your answer, you get full credit. Like you don't have to simplify anything. So. Question. Um, I'm going to pick Paul a ticket for that one because I do think it's wisest to not forget to put the units. They didn't specify units other than the you know assumptions dollars, of course, but I was definitely out the dollar sign. Oh, my mistake. See, they catch my error. Uh, there's no space between dollars and dollars. Oh, I'll take that. <laughs> um, there's another mistake. <laughs> That's very good. Um, there is another error. <laughs> Please. It says calculate the nearest dollar, how many dollars are collected, and you didn't calculate. Yeah, so I actually, hey, I got so excited about telling you that you don't need to, to do anything more. In this case, you actually do. If you don't keep going and round to the nearest dollar, they won't give you the point. So it's a really good example where I can't stop too early. So somebody quick, what's the? 90,000. 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, is that correct? Yes. There we go. <laughs> now we get full credit. Jonathan gets a ticket for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Anyone? <laughs> Please. It says using your answer from part A, so are we allowed to use the rounded answer to calculate part B, or do we have to use the full question? Outstanding. Hey, like, keep talking, Jackson. It's like I got 64 instead of 60. Everyone look here. Look here. Uh, this is again why it, no, it's a perfect question, but hey, take it for that. It's, it's, the perfect example of why you just gotta be reading slow and careful and not rushing. So because they said your answer from part A, well that was the rounded value. So to get the proper credit in this part E, you must be using that rounded value from part A. That makes sense? Now, hey, the, uh, how would I say this? The, um, the other thing that can occur it's not really very common on the AP test to use one answer from one part in another part. They don't usually do that. If they had not said to round the answer in part A, and you need to use it in part E, um, I would definitely use the stored version. But it's not common, so it's not coming to my mind that I've ever had to worry about that very often, but once in a while. Anybody else? Cool, next thing. So, so you have to go good because we passed out before Christmas. So. Okay, same situation. So I don't need to worry about that. The 
question says, how many people left the park for those eight during those eight hours? How many people left the park? So I just remember my little phrase again. Uh, if I integrate the rate at which people are leaving the park, I will calculate how many people actually leave the park during that time period. So I just want to integrate from time 9 to time 17 the rate. I integrate the rate at which people are leaving the park. I want to make sure this is making sense to me, so I just do a little check. I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. If 50 people per hour were leaving the park over an eight hour period, so taking the rate at which they're leaving multiplied by a duration of time, rate at which they're leaving multiplied by a duration of time, uh, that's going to work. So I'm just kind of checking my thought process. Questions about any of that? Super easy. Grab my calculator, type it in. Math 9. Hour 9 to 17. Y1. Ah, shoot. How many notices? Give yourself five, what the heck. Um, <laughs> just an error fast. Um, Twenty-two seventy-nine people. Let's say round to the nearest whole number. Okay, please remember, please remember, on the AP test, every time you perform an integral, you need to be writing down the integral that you're performing. Uh, the same is true of a derivative. When you calculate a derivative, you need to write a derivative so they understand what you're finding. So don't forget to do that. We don't need this. It's not going to hurt anything if you leave it. The grader will understand you're just kind of thinking. But Question. One. I'll leave question 2B for you to do at home, so we'll skip that. We're going to go to this extra example, G. It says, find the rate rounded to the nearest whole number. I wish the total number of people in the park is changing. So I talked about how I want to use this idea because I know it proves useful. I've seen it happen many times on the Indy test. So I want to make sure I tell the grader. I did it earlier. I don't have to do it again, but just so you remember that I did it. AFT represents the number of people in the park. Therefore, as I wrote over here in green, a prime is always going to equal the in rate subtract the out rate. A prime will always equal the in rate subtract the out rate. So now it simply becomes a Danica's chart problem. I'm trying to determine what's happening precisely at hour 14. So Danica's chart says total number of people in the park will be increasing at any moment where the rate at which the number, so the rate of change of the number of people in the park is positive, uh, similar for negative. So I'm trying to figure out, oh, wait a minute, I'm one step ahead of myself. They're just asking for the rate at a given time, so I just need A prime of 14. So I'll just write that down. A prime of 14 is simply going to equal E of 14 subtract L of 14. That will be the rate at which the number of people in the park is changing at that hour. Question. 
It's bothering me to just say I don't get it. We'll talk about it more. So let's take the calculator so we can see that better. So blue is the rate at which people enter the park. So we're going to go to hour 14. So that's 780 people per hour entering at that moment. So that helps me to visualize it a little bit. 780 people per hour doesn't mean if I stand at the front gate, I see 780 people. It just means there's a stream you know, of appropriate size of people so that if I waited an entire hour, I would count 780 come by. But simultaneously with that, we go to the red. Make sure you're careful. It changes the hour there. You've got to change that back to 14. 290, we'll just round, 291 people per hour are leaving. So when you stand at the front gate, you see two streams of people. You see a stream coming in and you see a stream going out. But they in part, uh, don't like this word, but in this case it actually works, they cancel each other. Right? Yeah, I know, horror. Um, uh, does that make sense? Yeah, because you got the stream coming in of 780 people per hour, stream going out of 291. So overall, we just subtract them to figure out what's the rate at which the number in the park is changing. Does that feel better? So just do it on your calculator. You don't want to round until the final answer, so just go to the main screen. You simply take Y1 of 14, subtract Y2 of 14, and you need to round that to the nearest whole number, so 489. So right here, A prime of 14 equals 49 people per hour. Question? We need to talk about it more. Um, let me get you to say it so it sticks better. What does A represent? Perfect. So A represents the number of people in the park. So what would A prime represent? You okay? Yeah. So in fact, I picture it like, uh, like I have a gauge. Like there's, a, there's some sort of control office at the park. And they actually have a gauge that says, oh, this is the number of people in the park. A prime is how fast that needle is moving. It's the rate at which that number changes. Does that help? Good work. Two more. Yeah, be the guy. Sit there. Hmm. Okay. Question. Awesome. Uh, that's it for that problem. So, anything else here? One of the keys to these problems uh, is what Allison's bringing up. You got to be careful to not get mixed up between the amount versus the rate. That's why, to me, Danica's chart is helpful to just keep your brain organized. And that's why you want to make sure you read slow and carefully. Okay, next one. Uh, to H is the number of people in the park. Okay, pause for a minute. Notice the difference. The last problem was asking about the rate. This time it's not asking about rate, it's asking about number. So I've got to be thinking of this column, amount. So my amount is A. 
And on the actual AP test, I wouldn't have to keep rewriting it because I would have it all laid out in this fashion. You'll have a booklet and it will give the information here and then you'll have like part A, B, C, and D typically. And so when I write something over here, I don't have to rewrite it when I'm working here. I can just reference, I just, the grader counts this all as one problem, so. Um, is the number of people in the park, so that's A, so it's saying is A, hello, is the number of people in the park increasing or decreasing? So I'm right here. At hour 14, so that's Danica's chart here. I just need to look at A prime. At hour 14, if A prime is positive, the number of people in the park will be increasing. If A prime is negative, the number in the park will be decreasing. It's very logical. It's exactly what we're talking to Allison about. We know that at hour 14, we have a stream of people entering the park such that if we counted them, we would get 780 per hour entry, only 291 per hour leaving. So obviously, the number in the park is going up. It's going up by exactly 49 people per hour at that moment. So all we have to write here is, just give a reason for your answer. Just write A prime, oh boy, a 14 is positive. So A of T is increasing at I just know about it. Yeah, so um, I obviously don't have the same level of, an, like Mr. Recti is like just full of energy and enthusiasm. Um, I can't match his energy and enthusiasm, except when I get like very naturally excited because of what we're discussing and how you're learning. Like today's just fairly mellow. Um, but there have been days in the past uh, when it actually occurred in January about four years ago um, that we were having a discussion it was actually first period a1 we're having a discussion and uh, it really became quite involved like it was a hard concept to understand and so as the class little by little started to really understand the idea I got very very naturally excited about the fact that you're making sense of it and um, I do have a little bit of a habit that when the class starts to get excited, I get excited. And uh, in, in the past, once in a while, when that's happened at the moment of like, like climax of the discussion, I'll just turn and just like smack the board like that with my palm, just because I, I don't know, just got excited. Well, this, this one day, four years ago, it was about January 26th. <laughs> Not that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't remember exactly, but it's something like that. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just getting excited. I can just feel the energy rising in the class. And uh, so I'm thinking, yeah, this is it. This is going to be like cool. Like, everybody's starting to really understand the idea. We're getting to the climax of the problem. I'm getting ready to turn and smack the board like this. But for some reason, a student in the back, um, her sisters are Gracie and Allie Wade. She's Sydney Wade, that's it. Yeah, her sisters were in my class last year. Uh, Sydney Wade, she's in the back, and she just starts going like this. Like, she goes, it's getting excited, you know. Um, so I see her doing this, and I'm like, yeah, getting excited. So <laughs> instead of, don't ever do this. <laughs> I warn you, do not do this. Oh, it's on the video. Um, do not do this. Ever, you will regret it for six weeks, actually the rest of your life. Um, I turn and instead of hitting the board with my flat palm, like I'll smack it pretty hard. I turn and with the full force of my body, I step into the board. Like I turn this and I'm like, BAM! 
Yeah, it was hilarious until I did it. Um, as soon as I did that, like I must have gone pale because the class like went dead silent. <laughs> One kid's like, you just broke your hand. And I'm like, I'm like just like about ready to pass out. I'm like, I'm holding it like this. I'm like, no, it's okay. <laughs> and like I grabbed the pen like this. I'm like, keep going. <laughs> and like holding my arm. And I'm like, Mr. Smith, you need to sit down. <laughs> you don't look good. And I'm like, I don't feel so good either. <laughs> So I sit down and somebody was super nice. They went to the training room, got me a bag of ice, and like I put it on like we've got to finish, guys. Come on, get back to the board, you know. Um, so I, I, oh yeah, don't do that. So I taught the rest of the day, just kind of as best I could, you know, like I'm gonna keep going. You can't quit calculus. Um, if you test is gonna get here. I go home that night, my wife kind of looks at us, well, maybe it's okay, we'll just let's see how it goes. And the next morning when it's like swollen like crazy. I go to the doctor, he takes an x-ray, he comes back, he's like, he's like, who are you mad at? <laughs> like, who did you punch? Where's the other guy? I'm like, why? He's like, well, you have what's known as a boxer's fracture. It happens when you hit something with a fist and it breaks the bone right there. So yeah, I broke that bone and you know, you have to be in a cast like for six weeks that holds your hand like this. <laughs> so I couldn't, like I had to type with one hand and one <laughs> finger. That's the worst. I had to switch the mouse. I couldn't run the mouse. I had to switch it to my other hand. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, but I did prove to myself and everyone else that I can get just as excited as Mr. Repton. Apparently, I just don't know how to control myself. I'm way over the top. We have one day where you're just like yelling like this and see what he does. I tried yelling like Mr. Recky and it's, it hurts my throat. I guess. <laughs> so now my hand won't open. Or like get a megaphone just to match him. Well, there you go. And yell into the wall. I do have a microphone system now. I can just turn the volume way up, you know. Just to get it in the Yeah, I know. Like I can. I think we won't spread anymore. Oh, well. <laughs> that was interesting. Questions here? <laughs> Sorry for the distraction. Are we good? Okay, next one. Keep going. Hey, huge key to these problems. You've got to keep straight whether you're talking about the rate or the amount. Uh, and then just and then chart integrals, you're all set. So next one. 2i. Suppose three or people were given the special privilege of entering the park prior to the park's official opening. Okay, look, you're gonna get sick of me saying it, but you gotta read slow and careful. As I read that statement, my brain said I should write something down. Here's what I decided to write. A of nine, A of nine is equal to 300 because at hour nine, there are already 300 in the park. A represents how many are in the park at any time. Question. Keep reading. Write an expression, N of T, for the total number of people in the park at time T. So what they did just right there is they finally invented a symbol, N of T, which has exactly the same meaning is the symbol I created, A of T. So maybe I should use their symbol now, although it's not super critical. Question. Okay, this is simply an application of the fundamental theorem. I'm supposed to figure out how many people are in the park at any time. Well, Right at 9 o'clock when the park opens, there are already 300. Then it's the in rate and the out rate that control how many people actually end up being in the park at any time. So all I have to do is combine them again. Uh, starts at 9 o'clock, goes to some time T. I could do this too, I guess. I could say A prime is the same thing as N prime. 
since they started using this symbol N. I have to write all that stuff down so the grader knows what I'm talking about. That's it. That's the answer. It's just a version of the fundamental theorem that we used heavily on the buff. Well, for the time period, would you just do the 9 to 23? Because that's hours that are open, or would you just do the team? Oh, awesome question. Um, take it for Logan. If I put 23, I will be calculating specifically, like if I put a 23 right here, I'll be calculating specifically how many are in the park at hour 23. Uh, they don't want me to do that. They want me to calculate for some you know, random time t. So it is crucial that I put a t here. Good question. There Gotcha. Uh, let's throw in some numbers and see if it helps. So n represents how many are in the park. That's like a certain number of people. And prime represents the rate at which that number goes up and down. So maybe a good example would be to say, hey, the rate of change of the number in the park is, I don't know, you know, 50 people per hour. If I multiply that by some duration of time, we keep using this eight hours as an example, uh, that's what I'm doing here. I'm multiplying a rate by a duration of time. The hours divide out, and I'm left with just a number of people. So that represents how the number in the park has changed over that time period. So it's the fundamental theorem. It's the rhyme. If I integrate the rate, at which n, n is changing, I discover by what amount did n change. Does that make sense? Two more, please. Are prime 23, are we going to end up with 300 x 54? We would in this case, yes. Because um, I didn't, the problem was designed without this idea in mind at all. Um, and then I tweaked it. That's what these little extra examples are. So I didn't really figure out a way to make the problem work out in a logical sense. You would have extra. Too poor. Please. Hold on. Look up. Listen to Matt. We'll take it for that one. Um, as I was using the symbol A, it was important that I tell the grader what A represents. Because he has no idea what I'm thinking A should be. So you saw earlier in the problem how I, I specified that. Um, I have to tell the grader that A prime is the in rate subtract the out rate. So he knows I'm understanding that. But you're right, Matt. When I get to this, if I got to this point in the problem and they say N represents total number of people in the park, um, I still think I'm going to write it. I don't know that it's absolutely necessary. Like, I don't know that you'd lose a point. But I just feel safer making sure the grader knows how I'm thinking. That answers your question. Oh, gotcha. My bad. What I was referencing is the fact that on an actual AP test, it would be this kind of situation where over here I would have already told the grader that A prime is the E of T minus the L of T. So I'm safe to just do this. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Perfect. Please. Would you lose points if you accidentally put E of T minus L of T? Yeah. Yeah, you've got to make sure you stick with the in rate minus the out rate. If you get it backwards, it'll be negative. They probably won't take away all the points because they'll notice that's what you did. They'll say, okay, we've got to dock them something for that mistake. And I'm hoping they'd be a little lenient after that. <laughs> and I can't guarantee it. Anybody else? Could answer your question. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Here's a little box I like to use for my memory. This is a kind of a verbal version of the fundamental theorem. Every time you integrate a rate, you find a change in an amount. Whenever you integrate a rate, you're calculating how much some amount changes. So right here, when we integrated the rate at which n is changing, you're calculating by what amount does n change. Question. Cool. Keep going. 2j here. Oh, I got it. I made one mistake. Sorry, I'll come back to this. Um, Okay, everybody, eyes up on me. You gotta focus hard on this one. This is a concept that if you really focus hard, it should click the first time. But if it doesn't click the first time, talk. Don't let it slide by, otherwise you'll have trouble for the rest of the year. Jack, look up for a second. Here we looking at me. Okay. Over here, this symbol T has a completely different me meaning than this symbol T and this symbol DT. So it is required on the AP test that you notice that and that you use different symbols when necessary. Here's what I mean. Um, Logan saw this really well. The T here simply, re simply represents some hour of your choosing. Like you could choose to calculate how many are in the park at hour 12 or you could choose to calculate how many are in the park at hour 16, whatever. That's this T here. That T has exactly the same meaning as the T here. So we're gonna put these in the same color. Those two have exactly the same meaning. If I put a 16 here, I have to put a 16 here. If I put a 16 here, I have to put a 16 here. You would have a question about that. There. Oh, yeah. What? And for whatever reason, there was like a T on the number that also be the same T. Yes. Eric said, "What if the formula, just for whatever reason, turned out to be something like this? It's not likely, but it could. This T would have the same meaning as well. So these three." In our example of where we choose t to be, say, 16, it would all have to be 16. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Two points for Andy. Positive feedback is always appreciated. Um, however, within the integral, here's where you got to really listen hard. Within the integral, this symbol has a totally different meaning. Because when the integration is performed on your calculator, here's what happens. The calculator takes 9, plugs it into the formula for n prime, and multiplies by a tiny duration of time. Then this value changes from being 9, it changes to like 9.00001. And that value gets plugged into n prime, and that gets multiplied by a tiny duration of like a very small dt. Then we change to 9.00002. That gets plugged in, then we go 9.00003. So this value here is just a placeholder. It doesn't equal 16. It equals a million different values of t. That's how integration works. Wave at me if you need me to say it again. So the AP test graders will not allow you to use the same symbol because they have a different meaning. So what you want to do is just change the symbol inside the integral to something else. My favorite is Z. You'll see them sometimes use S. I don't like S, it looks like a five. Um, some people say Z looks like a two, but not if you put the little bar through it. Um, <laughs> Z is not really used in our class for, I can't think of it being used for anything. So I'm going to use a Z. Now I don't lose any points for that little 
problem. So, questions? Wait, so you can just do that. You can just say, do you have to state um, n prime of z is equal to n prime of z somewhere above? You do not. Good question. Hey, listen. So that's one of those like hidden assumptions that they don't, ex you know, they don't expect you or require you to say anything about it. They just expect to see in your work that you understand that there's a difference. Like you understand that this variable cannot match this variable. It doesn't make any sense. So you just choose whatever, just some variable that's not being used in the problem in their farm. So I just always choose Z. W is a good choice as well. I've seen that used because W is not used much for anything. Please, Matt. Sit back so everyone can hear it. What Matt said was, if you're performing, an, if you're writing down an integral, and the limits of the interval are numbers. So if we have a number nine to twenty, then I'm just going to. This is like nine to twenty here. I'm going to leave this as just t. That's totally fine. That's actually the most common thing that happens. Once in a while, I get this situation where I've got to have a variable here or perhaps a variable here, now I can't have them match. That's what you said, right? Perfect. What do you have? Please. So along that same thing, if you have the 300 over t, are you still able to do n prime of t, or does it have to be a prime of t? Um, if it's all about the limits. Okay. So if this limit's a number, like 20, this can still be t. If this limit's a variable t, I've got to change this. It's all about these two being different meanings, so they can't be the same. Good point. Okay, next thing. Uh, here it says, okay, it's 300 people. What would be the total number of people around the nearest whole number? Uh, all we do is just use the formula. Like we have the formula right here, so all we're going to do is just use that. So I'm just going to show my work here. So we're going to get, we're trying to find n of, so you can see me, well, let's copy the formula over. Let's do that. So let's see if the magic board will work. Probably not. It always grabs the wrong thing. Well, maybe. Hey, success. It's not always gone. Um, we'll go here, paste that in. There we go, perfect. So I need to find n of 14. So n of 14. Is equal to 300. You wouldn't have to rewrite this on the actual test because you've already got the formula written down. You can just plug it in your calculator. So when I run this through my calculator, uh, 9 to 14 now. N prime. Here's what I do. I go to Y equal, and I make a Y. Well, no, we can just do it from the main screen. There's different ways. This is as good as any. So I've got to go 300. Now let's do it. Nah, come on. Let's just do the integral. Math 9. i got to go from 9 to 14. I've got to take y1, subtract y2. Okay, this integral is going to tell me by what number did the amount change over that time period. By what number did the amount change over that time period. Press enter. 3497. So there were 300 over that time period, even though people are entering and leaving. The net change is 3497 people. And I'm supposed to round to the nearest whole number, so that's okay. And um, now I would just add them. So 3797 people. Someone just came in the door. There we go. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.